Our next presenter is a very good friend of Southern Data Science Conference, Trey Granger. Uh, he is the founder of Search Kernel, and he's talking about relevance in the age of generative search. Um, I asked him for his term as well, and he said systems thinking. Please welcome Trey. Thank you. All right, excited to be here today as we're wrapping up. I'm going to be speaking about relevance in the age of generative search. Um, so as Beverly mentioned, um, I'm the founder of Search Kernel. We do AI-powered search consulting uh, for the last several years. For most of the last three years, I've also been the CTO of PreSearch, which is a decentralized search engine. Um, happy to talk offline about uh, what we do there. Uh, so the agenda for today, I'm going to speak about AI-powered search, what is it, sort of what are the different facets associated with it, talk about generative, generative search, uh, what is it, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then uh, talk about sort of the multimodal future of search. Uh, so if we think, so the initial question is what is AI-powered search? And if we think of deep learning as a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence, uh, Data science overlaps heavily with all of those, so it's got its own unique characteristics. Search as well overlaps. Uh, AI-powered search, of course, it's a Venn diagram, is going to be the intersection of artificial intelligence and search. Um, thus far, I've told you nothing. I've just drawn some pretty circles. Uh, so what does that actually mean? Uh, in the sphere of things that are artificial intelligence but not necessarily machine learning, uh, you've got things like question answer systems, virtual assistants, chatbots, rules-based relevance. Most of these today do use machine learning and deep learning, but they can also be built just as rules-based systems. So they sort of stand outside of just pure machine learning as a type of system. Um, and then, of course, you've got the intersection of search and machine learning. Here you've got things like signals, boosting models, learning to rank, uh, semantic search, collaborative filtering, personalized search, clustering, all sorts of NLT, NLP and entity extraction, semantic knowledge graphs, um, and so on. And then, of course, in the deep learning sphere, this is what most of uh, this conference has been about topically, uh, where we talk about things like foundation models and LLMs, neural search and vector search, word embeddings, multimodal search, which I'll speak about some, and retrieval augmented generation. So the, in the context of when I say AI-powered search, what I mean is all of these things. Uh, today I'm going to be focused on generative search, which is going to be mostly around LLMs, but uh, there's a lot more uh, to the topics. Um, if you're interested in learning about all of those topics, um, I am the author of the book AI Powered Search. We go through lots of those. Uh, feel free to get a copy. There's a discount code up there if you want a cheap copy today. Uh, but we go through retrieval augmented generation, generative search and summarization, learning to rank, semantic search, dense vector search, uh, fine tuning LLMs for search, personalized search and recommendations, knowledge graph learning, user signals boosting, click models, and crowdsource relevance. So feel free to check that out if you want to dive deeper into any of those topics. Uh, one of the nice things about going um, near the end on the last day is I can delete about half my slides and really just focus on the core material because at this point everybody here knows what embeddings are. Uh, you can have word and phrase embeddings, sentence embeddings, paragraph embeddings, document embeddings. Um, refer to this as chunking and breaking it apart into pieces, but you take these embeddings and you today map them into a search engine or a vector database. Uh, if you think of the way a traditional search engine works, um, you've got, got something called an inverted index, which takes all of your terms and puts them in a, what is effectively a sparse matrix, where the number of dimensions is equal to the number of terms that are in all of your documents. So unlike you know, a 1536 dimension embedding that might come from an LLM, in this case, I might have millions or billions of dimensions where every dimension is a keyword. Um, if you map this into dense vector thinking, like you would have with the vector database, you have something like what's on the right, where you have what is called one hot encoding, where each term, you know, if it exists in the uh, embedding, will have a, have a one representing it. Um, but the trick with LLMs and with um, uh, what we've been doing with uh, dense vectors is dimensionality reduction. And we don't think of it this way, but if you think of that giant matrix where there's millions or billions of dimensions, where every dimension is a word, then this top example where I've got one apple, and the Apple logo and a bunch of apples, you can see that with the one hot encoding, I've got the first two match, match the dimension of Apple, the text Apple, and the third one matches the dimension of apples. 
Uh, we've done something called uh, stemming or limitization in search engines, you know, as far as I've ever been working in them for, for decades and decades. Um, and these are effectively a dimensionality reduction technique that maps all those terms down into their root forms. And so instead of apple and apples, you have apple. Instead of apply, apply, it applies. You just have apply. Um, so this is a very basic form of dimensionality reduction that doesn't reduce that much. But the magic with LLMs and everything we've been talking about here is doing semantic uh, dimensionality reduction. So this is taking terms and instead of mapping them into other terms, uh, we map them into concepts. So in this case, I've got a bunch of terms here on the left. I map them into concepts like food, drink, dairy, caffeine, and give them weights based upon how well they fit into those um, dimensions. Uh, and of course, we've got large language models, which you've heard a lot about this um, conference. Uh, we also refer to abstractly these kinds of models as foundation models, because you have models that aren't just language models. You have vision foundation models and audio foundation models that are trained on audio versus video. And you also have multimodal models, which are trained on multiple different types um, of data. So if you train on text and on uh, images, for example, then you can search you know, for images through text, et cetera, by mapping them into a similar vector space. Um, as an example, this is uh, a visualization of dimensions from the, uh, the stable diffusion you know, vision model. Um, it, um, and if you look at this sort of cluster over here on the far right, uh, these, the things there happen to be similar, and they all seem to have to do with Darth Vader. That's sort of a, the area within vector space that's being occupied there. If I look at this cluster up here on the top left, um, and I look at what's similar and related to those items, there are pictures of dogs, and more specifically, cute puppies. Uh, and so um, the idea with these uh, embeddings is that we are able to map things into uh, dimensions so that they cluster together um, if they're similar. Um, take a cosine of any of these vectors, and you can compare two items together to figure out which ones are similar. Uh, and of course, with a search engine or a vector database, uh, they work by taking documents or chunks of documents, feeding them to an encoder from a transformer, generating embeddings and indexing those embeddings, putting them into uh, the database so they can be searched. And then we do the same thing at query time with the search engine. We take in queries, transform them into a query vector, and then do a similarity search to try to find similar documents using the embeddings. Uh, what's happened over several years is that traditional uh, search, which is over represented on the far left of the spectrum, um, is token matching. It tr traditionally hasn't had dense vector search capabilities to be able to index embeddings. So things like Apache Lucene, Solar Elastic Search, et cetera, fall um, on the far left. Uh, newer uh, technologies, vector databases like Pinecone, Redis has these capabilities, Weaviate, those. Um, those kind of technologies uh, were built to handle more of the vector indexing and searching. But what each sort of camp has learned is that you need both, and you need a hybrid of both. And so in the sort of traditional search Lucene community, they're aggressively adding vector search capabilities that make them more efficient. And on the vector database side, all the vendors are aggressively adding traditional search capabilities. Um, and at the end, we're going to have a bunch of technologies that all can do largely the same thing, but you know, are, are specialized in different ways. But along this spectrum, um, there's techniques like term expansion, sparse retrieval and dense re-ranking, and hybrid sparse retrieval and dense vector search that all have uh, pros and cons in terms of how you emphasize retrieval and relevance um, in the search space. Um, and then there's generative search, which is somewhat of an entirely different animal. Uh, first of all, what is generative search? So I type this into search engine. Uh, this search engine says generative search is the type of search algorithm that generates new solutions to problems rather than just selecting from a pre-existing set of solutions. It's often used in artificial intelligence and machine learning applications. That entire blurb was just generated and put in my search results. It didn't exist prior to me typing that query in. That's an example of generative search. It's, it's new information being surfaced as opposed to just read you know, directly from, from content. And so the way I typically think about this as you've got traditional search techniques like your 10 results, your, your 10 blue links, uh, info boxes that show information on the side that's pre-vetted from known sources, and then you've got things like extractive question answering, where I can ask a question, go find the documents containing the question, extract the answer out, and then show it back. The answer's still found in the documents, but it's um, being pulled out and shown as a result. 
Uh, but then once we get into the yellow side of this spectrum here, we get to things like result summarization. So this is, you know, not, don't just find me results, but take the results and, and answer my question or summarize the results, maybe cite sources, those kinds of things. Um, abstractive question answering um, is the same thing, but it's, it's generating answers to the questions from the models or the data in the search engine as opposed to just extracting them. And then you've got new content generation where I run a search for an image that image doesn't exist, it gets created for me on the fly and returned in my search results, or possibly the content in my search results gets, some of it gets created on the fly and shown to me. Um, e extractive question answering is, um, you know, fairly straightforward. It uses something called a retriever reader pattern, where you go, uh, first you try to, if it's, say it's a vector search, you go find the documents that are the most similar to the question that are probably gonna answer the best. You pull those in and then you run a reader across those documents to extract out the part of the document that contains the answer and you return the answer. Extractive question answering, abstractive question answering, and summarization, I kind of put these together in one slide, um, is the process of finding the answer and then uh, showing me you know, what the results were. So in this case, I used um, uh, GPT here, but step one is just execute a search to find the most relevant results. Uh, which is the, um, you know, going to the search engine, getting the results. You then take those results and put them into a prompt, uh, which is the prompt you see down below. And my prompt is web search results. Here's a result. Here's result number two. And then here's some instructions. Instructions are used to provide web search results. Um, using them, write a comprehensive reply to the given query. Make sure to cite results using this format. Um, to, um, so you've got your sources cited, if the provided results refer to multiple subjects with the same number, write separate answers for each subject. Query, what is a large language model? So the end user typed in what is a large language model. We took that, found results, passed them to the LLM, and then we get the results on the right, which are cited results from real sources describing the LLM as opposed to hallucinated results potentially coming back uh, directly from the model. Um, so those are the cool things, the good things, what about the bad? So we all know about hallucinations. I don't need to spend much time on them. If I type in Trey Granger, Georgia, um, apparently I'm a professional basketball player that plays in the Atlanta Hawks, so not, not true. Uh, if I type in Trey Granger, Midland, Ontario, I'm pr apparently a professional photographer who specializes in wedding portraits, so if you're getting married, give me a call. Um, if you're on, in Ontario, if I type in Trey Granger, Puerto Rico, I'm apparently also a basketball player um, in the uh, BSN leak. Um, so those are all bad results. Of course, if I ask it, how tall is Trey Granger that plays for the Atlanta Hawks? I'm six foot four. Um, I will definitely take that one, so it's not all bad. Um, and there's lots of different techniques you can use to um, get around this. There's one interesting one called Hide, where you can actually, um, instead of having the model generate um, incorrect answers, you can have it generate incorrect answers and then use those incorrect answers to go find um, documents that might contain similar types of answers and then you can give the real answer from those, so uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, but in terms of the bad for generative search, I want you to look at these two sets of search results here and tell me which one is better. The, one, the question is, is the earth flat? And I've got two separate sets of search results. Uh, the one on the left says, no, the earth is not flat. It's an oblate spheroid shape. The one on the right says, yes, it is. They cite the exact same documents, the exact same sources, but on the left it says why some people believe the earth is flat. On the right, it says why the Earth is flat. On the left, it says fighting flat Earth theory. The title on the right is arguing for a flat Earth theory. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that not only could you theoretically do with these LLM technologies, I literally took this query, gave this prompt to ChatGPT, rewrite the following article, but change it to argue that the Earth is flat and not round, and got these exact results. So it's, it's not only possible to do things like this, it is the, these technologies are capable today. You could generate a search engine that interned, returned entirely biased results, arguing for any viewpoint. It's incredibly, um, potentially dangerous uh, for society. So, um, won't get into the, the pros and cons of that, but one of the other problems with these models is that um, the data, like if you go to Google, you can find all sorts of results from Reddit, from you know news companies, et cetera, where AI has been used to generate them and you can actually get the results back. So now our training sets for these models have been poisoned, uh, which is you know, a giant mess. Um, so that's some of the interesting things happening in generative search. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about quickly is multimodal search. 
Um, so uh, multimodal search, again, if you take text and images, feed them to a model, um, or text images and videos, then you can do interesting things to try to query across different modalities, right? I search for children's cat book and find the images, search for, you know, just a whole bunch of different combinations here. Um, but what you can also do when you train these is take, for example, a text encoder layer, generate embeddings, take an image encoder layer, generate embeddings, and then you can also do things like take collaborative signals, so, so your user, you know, purchase, add to cart, histories, et cetera. I'm gonna add those in, and then do a dimensionality reduction to try to find the similarities between these different modes of, uh, of data ingestion. And so if you're familiar, I'm not gonna spend much time on this because it's a short talk, but um, if you're familiar with collaborative filtering, uh, the way it typically works is by taking a user item inter um, interaction matrix um, and then doing matrix factorization to derive two other matrices, a, a user feature matrix and an item feature matrix. Um, both of these that I have listed here, I've generated three latent features, which are effectively at three additional dimensions, and I've extracted a value that applies to the user and a value that applies to the items. You can easily take those and generate recommendations for users, but you can also take those latent factors from your signals and add them in along with your other dimensions in your you know, LLM, for example, that were learned by the large language models, and use those to derive additional insights. Um, and not only collaborative filtering, which I've got in the top right here, but there's all sorts of other models, signals boosting models, using click models for learning to rank, to generate features, to re-rank, um, and all sorts of ways to, to personalize search results um, as well. Um, and the last item, just to throw this out here, is that in addition to building models, building multimodal models from all this data, it's also very powerful to use different query modalities as well. And so, for example, when I'm querying, this is a pipeline here for a query, I'm taking the query in, understanding the, the keywords, extracting out locations, applying signals boosting, applying um, knowledge graph lookups, rewriting queries, doing you know, knowledge graph lookups, doing LLM lookups, um, cosine similarities, and doing re-ranking. All of these are different ways of querying the same underlying data, and doing these types of things significantly improves the relevance of your search engine or your retrieval augmented generation. And so, where we go in the future from this, I've obviously talked about multimodal search. Um, and uh, one of the questions, given all these different ways of training data, these different modalities, is what's next? So we have text, we have images, we have video, uh, we have user interactions, but what are the kinds of things that humans experience that foundation models can't currently? So things like touch, sight, hearing, smell, thinking. Over time, as we have IoT and as we have other technologies, these, all, all of this data from all of these sensors is gonna be feeding in to these models to learn new and interesting insights that are gonna help power them better. So it's gonna be an interesting um, future with all of that. So anyway, if you're interested in more techniques around AI-powered search, going through some of that in more depth, or you know, um, other techniques we didn't go through today, feel free to check out AI-powered search. Um, and otherwise, I thank you uh, for your time. Thanks everybody, appreciate it.